It's time for Herd Mentality, the weekly episode where you control the discussion today on Locked On Bills. You are Locked On Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run, also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I am your host of Locked On Bills. I want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are. Those of you who never miss a single episode, I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Well, folks, welcome to Herd Mentality. And I know that I said our next conversation after the post game reaction podcast uh, to the Bills win over the Chargers would be the All Twenty Two review. Well, folks, unfortunately, I woke up on Tuesday morning. Early, like I always do, fully expected, expecting to be able to dive into the game film, but the game film wasn't available yet, and usually it's available. So I needed to record two episodes on Tuesday, one being Herd Mentality, one being the All-22 Review. So I'm doing Herd Mentality first, and I hope to be able to circle back to All-22 Review later today, assuming that I have the film necessary to do the All-22 Review. So We'll start with herd mentality, and then you'll you'll hear from me soon with the all twenty two review. But it does take a good amount of time to comb through the tape and study it, and really come away with the takeaways that I need um, to share with you. But we will do herd mentality now. We have some great stuff to dig into, and this one, his first one, comes from Bills fan O one, and he says, "Hey Joe, for the Bills passing game struggles, I have a couple of theories, and curious to hear your opinion. One." Josh Allen is a rhythm quarterback, and he needs more passing attempts. I get everyone wants to run the ball, but I still believe Josh Allen plays much better when he gets 30-plus throws a game, and he seems to struggle at times when they ask him to manage a game. Number two, too many personnel packages. Under Brady, the Bills were at its best against the Eagles and Jets, and in those games, it seemed like there was a lot of 11 personnel with Kincaid, Shakir, Gabe, and Diggs. I think that's the bread and butter of the Bills' offense. The Bills have gotten away from that a bit since Knox's return. This is not to say that you can't mix things up, but I just feel there's been a lot of heavy jumbo sets, and Josh seems to operate better in spread. Good question. I've talked about these passing game issues for the last several games, really the last four, and I do want to dive into this. I want to spend some time on this question, and I think it's important because as we – forecast the Bills moving forward, and we're all hopeful for a deep postseason run. Throwing the football is going to be a big part of that, and it should be. I mean, you got Josh Allen and Stephon Diggs, and right now that's not really working. And so I appreciate this question, and I want to kind of speak directly to the two things that were brought up, but also get into some of the reality of what's going on and some of my thoughts as to why it's not what it needs to be right now. Uh, the first item that was brought up here was Josh Allen, a rhythm quarterback, needing passing attempts. Probably, uh, you know, obviously Josh Allen's going to be at his best when he's lathered up and has lots of throws and has seen the defense and can adjust and make plays. I, I think that's probably pretty fair. But you've also seen the Bills uh, be able to lean on the rushing offense a bit and that be successful. I, I think you should be able to do both. And I think it's important for you as an offense and as a football team to be able to win and execute and find ways to win in different ways, right? It shouldn't always need to be Josh Allen throwing the ball 30 plus times a game, right? You should be able to win other ways. And I'm fortunate. Fortunately, I think the Bills have shown that they can win games in other ways. And I think that's a good thing. As for the personnel packages and, you know, kind of leaning more into spread, I think that's probably true. I, I've always thought that Josh Allen's at his best when it's, uh, four receivers on the field, empty sets, make it a space game and see if other teams can stop it. And usually they can't. So I would agree with, with a lot that's going on with, with your ideas, but I have some more that I want to share. Um, and what I also want to share is 
the numbers. I want to talk about the numbers behind this because there were some people uh, last week when I was talking about passing game issues on YouTube that just were not very um, accepting of me willing to say that the passing game isn't very crisp right now. And you know, Josh Allen has scored 40 touchdowns and I'm being nitpicky and hard on him. I don't know, man. Like I, I love Josh Allen. He's my favorite football player ever. I've said before in this podcast, his arrival to the Buffalo Bills and how he's played has absolutely changed my life. I mean, there, don't get me wrong. I love Josh Allen, but I'm also going to be honest with you on these podcasts and talk about uh, things that are going well and things that are not going well with the team. And over the last four games, the passing offense has been maybe average, maybe with a lot of issues in terms of not just Josh Allen, the receivers finishing with consistency, protection issues, right? It's it's all of it. And that's why I say passing game. I don't say Josh Allen. I say passing game. And I think you can simultaneously appreciate how elite Josh Allen is, one of the best players of the game in the game, if not the best player in the game, and all the production. And you'd say, you know what? There's some things here that can be better that would make this football team even better. And I'd hope that any fan could be able to understand that. And so let's talk about this in case you're like, Joe, what are you talking about? This passing game seems fine to me. Well, let's look at the numbers. This is over the last four games, the last four. Josh Allen, yards per attempt, seven. That's 18th in the NFL. Josh Allen passing touchdowns over the last, over his last four games, five. That's 15th in the NFL. Drop rate, 9.8%. That's fourth highest in the NFL. So over the last four games, the Bills have the fourth highest drop rate of any team in the league. Josh Allen's passer rating the last four games, 82.3. That's 24th in the NFL. Nearly bottom 25% of the league. Josh Allen under pressure, 42% of dropbacks. That's ninth highest in the NFL. And so I saw, I say it's passing him. I just told you drop rate, 9.8%, fourth highest in the league. Pressure percentage, 42% of dropbacks, ninth highest in the league. Those are things that don't all, all have to do with Josh Allen. It's a passing game problem. How about this one? This one really speaks to me. Josh Allen's passer rating when kept clean over the last four games, 78.7. That's 29th in the NFL. That's terrible. When he's not facing any pressure, none at all, his passer rating is 78.7. There's only a couple of guys worse than that. Yards per attempt when kept clean, no pressure, 6.7, 24th in the league. Completion percentage when kept clean, kept clean 60.8, 30th in the NFL. Folks, the Bills passing game right now can be a lot better. It's not performing to its capacity. Those numbers tell you that. And my eyes, your eyes should tell you that when you watch the games. It's not clean right now. And, and at the root of it is Josh Allen throwing the ball to Stephon Diggs. That's not going the way it should right now. 500-yard games in the first six of the season, off to a great start. And the last four weeks to Stephon Diggs have been dreadful. Josh Allen, when throwing the ball to Stephon Diggs over the last four games, 19 completions, 36 attempts, for 175 yards with a touchdown and two interceptions. That's a passer rating of 52.4. Josh Allen's passer rating when throwing the ball to Stephon Diggs the last four weeks is 52.4. And you want to act like there's not a problem. That's not good enough. And part of me is like, wow, I can't believe we're at week 17. The Bills are knocking on the door of the playoffs. Feel like you can beat any team in the AFC. And you look at your operation and say, you know what? 17 throwing the ball to 14 is not very good right now. I'm surprised that's where we're at. But also, we kind of got here last year. Now, last year, we talked about Josh Allen playing through the, the elbow injury and leaning into the deep throws and that being a problem. Well, there's different issues this year. And it's not that, not that Stephon Diggs isn't getting opportunity. He's got 36 targets. That's 16 more than any other player on the team. Gabe Davis, number two in targets with 30, with, 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 with 16 less, excuse me. Stefan Diggs has the ninth most targets in the NFL over the last four games. So the opportunity is there. It's just not effective. Part of that's misfires from Josh. Part of that's drops from Stefan Diggs. Missed opportunities to finish plays, but not on the same page. And Gabe obviously had a great game against the Chargers, but he's been in this as well. I mean, the, the efficiency to Dalton Kincaid's not there. The production to Khalil Shakir is very good, but in a small sample size. 
earlier in the season when the narrative for the Bills passing game was Josh is locking in on Stefan Diggs and other guys aren't getting enough opportunity. Josh Allen would say in press conferences, he says, I'm just trying to throw the ball to the open guy. And us, me, I was thinking, wow, it'd be great if he can get some of these other players more involved. Now you started to see some of that, but it's fallen off to Stefan Diggs. I think there's five contributing factors that stand out to me. Number one is turnovers, right? There's a narrative out there about Josh Allen and turning over the football. And I can't help but think that it's some in some way it creeps into his decision making. He doesn't want to throw another interception. Right? That's got to creep into the decision making a little bit. And the, the common denominator, I talked about this with Jordan Palmer, who's actually Josh Allen's personal quarterbacks coach. The common denominator in every quarterback that's playing at, high, at a high level is confidence. They're confident in what they're doing. And you can't tell me that the turnovers don't creep in a little bit on Josh with his decision making. Number two is Steph's production. Right now, that's not a good situation. We talked about it. I'm sure that's part of Josh Allen's thought process right now going into games. And you see it early on because they try to force a couple throws early to Stephon Diggs every single week. So now you're, all right, you're turning over the ball. You're not getting the ball effectively to your number one receiver that, you know, there's always seems to be a little something there. Gabe Davis's production, we talked about it going into the Chargers game for the last six games, no catches. That's probably weighing on his mind. Well, I got to not turn over the ball. I got to get the ball to Steph. I got Gabe's not getting the ball at all. I got to do something there. Oh, by the way, we just drafted this tight end in the first round after paying this other guy $14 million a year. Probably need to throw the ball to those guys at tight end. And then, meanwhile, the, the running backs have been really productive, but that's maybe taking away from the other stuff. I know that feels like maybe an oversimplification, but that's all got to work together to, to affect some things here because that's my frustration is it's some of the decision-making from Josh. It's some of the pressure but it's also some of the not finishing plays. And then kind of through that, you see these numbers that aren't where they're supposed to be. They came out against the Chargers on Saturday night, and they wanted to throw the football. And I know you might look at that game and say, well, you know, they wound up having pretty good yards per attempt. Josh Allen had a high completion percentage over 70%. But I think ultimately in them feeling the game out, the first three drives, and then wanting to lean on the passing offense and the results of those first three drives being what they were, they said, we got to get back to running the ball. And then the offense found, well, they certainly found their spark with the throw to Gabe Davis for 57 yards, but then they worked in the run a little bit more. Let's look back at it. The first drive of the game against the Chargers, the first play was a no-yard completion to Stephon Diggs, and yet a great 14-yard completion to Khalil Shakir, a two-yard run from Cook, and then an incomplete pass to Diggs, incomplete pass to Davis, you punt the ball. Second drive, Leonard Fournette gets a three-yard gain. Then you play action, great throw to, to uh, Gabe Davis for 17 yards. Then a Josh Allen scramble, James Cook for minus one, incomplete to Davis, punt. And that was a missed throw to Gabe Davis. That was an open pass. Then on the third drive, you come out, you run the ball three times in a row. You get five, ten, and then three. The next play is a scramble. And Mitch Morris gets called for a hold. You bring him back. It's second and 17. Seven-yard completion to Dawson Knox. Incomplete pass to Dalton Kincaid and a punt. So in your first three drives of the game, 16 plays were called. 11 of them were called passes. Five were called runs. They punted three drives in a row and had misfires from Josh Allen along the way. You had protection issues along the way. You had penalties along the way. And they said, well, this ain't working. Now, Fortunately, they came out and got a 57-yard pass to Gabe Davis, and that sparked things, and that's been my point with the passing offense. It's not that it's been all bad. There's been some great moments. It's been opportunistic. But in terms of the precision, the tempo, the ability to just lean on that, Josh Allen throwing the ball all over the yard, it's not there, and I want it to be there, right? And you should too, right? That's going to be a big part. The Bills are going to go do something this year, win playoff games, Josh Allen being consistent in the passing game and the passing game being consistent has to happen. And right now, it just isn't. I want it to be, but it just isn't. All right, I said we were going to spend some time on that question. We spent probably more time than I anticipated, so we got a lot to get to here, so be sure to stick with us. But, folks, as the weather gets colder, the NFL offers stay hot on FanDuel. Right now, new customers can get 100 
and $50 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's a 150 bucks if your team wins. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app is super easy to use, and there's a ton of different things that you can bet on, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn, FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, the next one here comes from Dan, who says, this has been weighing on me since last week. I know everyone was excited about potentially winning the division if the Dolphins lost one of two games and the Bills won two. But is it bad that I'm okay if the Dolphins win out? If the Dolphins, Chiefs, and Bills win next week, the Bills have a 99% chance of making the playoffs. And with the division out of reach, wouldn't that allow the Bills to rest some guys and try to get into the playoffs healthy? All right, so yeah, let's talk about this. Uh, first of all, I want to win the division. More, like, Give me the division all day long. That's what I want. I want for the Bills to win the next two. I want for the Dolphins to lose to the Ravens and the Bills. That's what I want to happen. I think that puts you probably at the number two seed. That means you're playing the wild card and the divisional round in Buffalo. We know the Bills are a better team in Buffalo than they are on the road. There's no doubt about it. And you get that advantage of January football in Western New York. I want that more than anything. I want that more than potentially being able to rest players against Miami. I want the division. I want probably two home games in the playoffs at least. Now, the Bills do have a very logical path to clinching next week. If they win, if they beat the Patriots and the Chiefs beat the Bengals and the Seahawks beat the Steelers, the Bills take, you know, the Bills punch their ticket to the postseason. It's that simple. You beat the Patriots, the Chiefs beat the Bengals, Seahawks beat the Steelers, you're going to the postseason. That's it. It's that simple. But if the Dolphins lose to the Baltimore and you can play in week 18 and the winner takes the division, you go you go play everybody, you try to win that game. Now, if the Dolphins clinch the division before week 18, which all they have to do is beat Baltimore, all they have to do is beat Baltimore, right? Then it's theirs. And then we can have conversations about resting players. Now, I'd be hesitant. On offense, we just talked about this passing game. I think they need reps. So I'd at least play them for a quarter, a half, something. I'd do something to get some rhythm going there. I'd be selective overall with who I rested. I'd try to rest the right players. And obviously, you can't rest everyone. You still got to dress 48 of them and get through a football game. But I would have to ask myself who would benefit the most from the rest and pick those players. But step one, try to win this division. Step two is if that can't happen in Baltimore, you know, loses to Miami next week, then I think you can have that conversation. But you still, you operationally need to be better in the passing game. And I would want reps in week 18 to help myself, even if I couldn't win the division. The Bills are probably going to be either the two, six, or seven seed. I think that's the reality of what we're staring at. Next one here comes from Ethan, who says, You recently mentioned that last year James Cook was the player that had the most in season growth. Who is that player this year for you on both offense and defense? like this question, I would say my pick on offense is James Cook again. I think James Cook has shown the most in-season growth of any offensive player. And I mean, just from the way the season started to the way it finished. And not that James Cook was ever bad in 2023, but I think him stepping into this lead running back role, there was a maturation process that went with it. And I think as I take myself on my own journey of studying James Cook this season, I think a lot about earlier in the year, maybe not coming in with a ton of like convictions with how he was seeing the field and, and hitting holes. And it felt like they needed to give him a series and he kind of flopped. And then Latavius Murray would come in and do some good things. And then James Cook would be like, all right, I can, I'm ready to go. I think he's done a much better job as the season moved along of being consistent from snap, you know, first snap of the game, to the last snap of the game and, and really embracing what it means to be a lead ball carrier in the NFL. So I thought he improved last season a ton from week one to week 17. I think this year he's improved the most of any offensive player, but through a different lens where I, I've talked about not, not just right now, the, how he starts and finishes games, but also the vision, the patience, the contact balance, the decision-making as a running back. I think all of that has improved so much. And I've, I've talked a lot about vision in the hole. I think that's been really good for James Cook. So I'd say him on offense, defensively, it's got to be Tyrell Dotson. 
I uh, thought he was rough in training camp. Um, and then, you know, he kind of, he felt like he was going to be the Mike linebacker after Terrell Bernard misses all of the preseason. And then he's not, and he's kind of on the shelf and Matt Milano goes down and all of a sudden he's got to play a bunch and right off initially, he wasn't even playing over Dorian Williams that changed quick. And I think his ability to kind of settle into a role, um, as a downhill player, a short zone defender has been really good. I think his in-season growth has been the best of any defensive player. Ryan says, if you had to pick a Bills position coach of the year, who would it be? I'm thinking it's either Aaron Cromer or Bobby Babbage, but I suppose a case can be made for John Butler too. I think you can make a case for four uh, p- assistant coaches. You mentioned Bobby Babbage and Aaron Cromer and John Butler. I'd throw Skip Kelly, the running backs coach, into the mix. Think about Bobby Babbage at linebacker. Not only are you replacing Tremaine Edmonds, who's been your five-year starter at linebacker, um, but the guy that winds up being your answer misses all of preseason and Terrell Bernard. Then your all pro Matt Milano's gone in week five. And all of a sudden you got to figure out how to make it work with Terrell Bernard, Tyrell Dotson, Dorian Williams, Dorian Williams kind of flops out. You put Tyrell Dotson in there you figure that out. Now Poyer's playing linebacker and safety. I, I mean, that's just a ton. That's a ton to work through. That's an unbelievable job by Bobby Babbage. Aaron Cromer, what a job, right? Year one to year two for him with this offensive line. Two new starters at guard, Connor McGovern, Osiris Torrance. On top of that, you're trying to get Spencer Brown to realize the ceiling. And then, of course, no drop-off from your vets and Mitch Morris and Deion Dawkins. Aaron Cromer's been unbelievable. Skip Kelly at running back, uh, transitioning away, transitioning away, excuse me, from Devin Singletary, who was your leading running back the last four years, into a guy that's never been a lead running back at college or at the NFL level while all of the depth behind him is new in Latavius Murray and Damian Harris, Damian Harris is on the shelf. Ty Johnson becomes something off your practice squad and Leonard Fournette's starting to do that. I mean, how about the job of Skip Kelly to navigate all of that? And then of course, John Butler, the secondaries coach, passing in coordinator on defense. I mean, injuries all year long at safety and corner. Trey White out for the year. Hyde's missed time. Poyer's missed time. Benford's missed time. You on board with Soul Douglas in the middle of the season because you, you need him. Uh, you're not getting what you want out of out of Kyer Elam. He winds up getting injured, but he has to play some. Uh, I think I think all four of those guys have done an unbelievable job with their respective position groups and deserve a lot of credit for things that we you know could have gotten the season off the rails, not getting off the rails. So Bobby Babich at linebackers, Aaron Cromer at offensive line, Skip Kelly at running backs, and John Butler, uh, passing game coordinator, secondary coach. Deserve a lot of love. All right, we got more to get to, so be sure to stick with us. But, folks, you shouldn't have to worry when you're buying tickets to your next big event. Game time is here, and it's the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. They've got killer deals on last minute tickets, all in prices, views from your seat, and a best price guarantee. I mean, simply put, game time takes the guesswork out of buying tickets. I'm actually in a little bit of a limbo myself right now. Nate Bargatsky, who I love, he's a comedian. He's coming to Charlotte um, in January, and it's a Sunday concert. And it's the, it's the first Sunday of Wild Card Weekend where I, I, the, are the Bills going to be in it? Are they going to play during those time slots? Well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to wait for the schedule to come out, and if we can go, we're going to use game time to get those tickets because they are the premier spot for last-minute tickets. They also um, – do a great job with flash deals, right? So like you log into the app, you never know what's going to be offered to you and they send the tickets right to your phone. So you can snag the tickets without the stress with game time, download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on NFL for $20 off your first purchase terms apply again, create an account and redeem code locked on NFL for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right. A few more to get to here. Next one is from David who says, How do you think the Bills' defense matches up with the 49ers and Ravens' offense? Are there any comparable offenses we've faced this season? So as for the the Ravens, obviously a big statement win over the 49ers. I think they were – 49ers turned it over five times and had ten penalties, right? That's going to be tough to win any game when you do that. And credit to the Ravens. They turned over – they took away the football. Uh, The Bills – Defense against Lamar Jackson, I think, has been the best defense in the NFL against Lamar Jackson, right? There's been quite a few matchups 
uh, really over the last four years that you can point to and, and, and say the Bills did a good job here. Um, obviously, that was under Greg Roman as the offensive coordinator for the Ravens, and now they have Todd Munkin, so that's a little bit different. But I think the Bills have done a good job of understanding what Lamar's strengths are and trying to do their best to limit that. So I think the Bills' defense, uh, not that I, it's no easy task. I respect Lamar Jackson a ton. He's, he's a great football player. I think you could point to a resume of success that gives you some level of comfort that the Bills kind of know what they need to do uh, to be able to bottle them up. Uh, as for the 49ers offense, um, it's a lot like the – it's a Shanahan off. It, it is the Kyle Shanahan offense. And, of course, the Dolphins run the Mike McDaniel offense, which he's a Shanahan disciple. Uh, the Bills have also faced last year the Jets. Uh, with Michael Fleur, who's a Shanahan disciple, Packers is a Shanahan disciple. So they've, they've had their opportunities to face this type of offense. But of, of course, the, the most extreme version of that being the Miami Dolphins. And of course, the Bills held them to 20 points. We'll see what happens in week 18. Um, and so I think that's kind of the stuff that's the most similar. Comes down to tackling. You got to tackle against the 49ers and be prepared for a 60 minute battle. You know, they really come after you and, uh, great dynamic playmakers. So hopefully I would love to spend two weeks talking to you about how the bills can stop the 49ers uh, on offense. And and that would require both teams getting the super bowl. So sign me up for that. Uh, but in, in terms of this question, yes, the bills have faced the dolphins, which is a team that is very, very similar stylistically to the 49ers. Now it's a, it's a turbocharged version that right? they have different dynamics, but I think a lot of the the rules are pretty simple, similar in terms of how they want to attack you defensively. Tommy says Gabe Davis's prediction. He has he has a Gabe Davis prediction. He, he sent this before the Chargers game, so I give him credit here. Uh, Tommy says he's going to explode, but not until deep into the postseason, just when everybody has forgotten about him. Well, maybe it happened a little bit sooner. I hope it continues. You know that I'm not been you know the biggest uh, Gabe Davis fan, but I hope that he makes a ton of plays, and yeah, I, I'm certainly rooting for him to help the Bills. Um, so uh, maybe it came a little early, but we'll take whatever we can get from these receivers right now because the consistency, as we talked about earlier, has just not been uh, very, very good. And and we'll see how it continues the rest of the way. It'd be nice to, be nice to have a little bit more of what we saw uh, against the Chargers show up uh, with some consistency as opposed to just like this feast or famine uh, type uh, deal with Gabe Davis where it's literally nothing or literally a hundred yards and a touchdown. So not a whole lot of in between this year when it comes to Gabe Davis. Uh, Sergeant Sheepdog says during the game, Taron Johnson was called for a personal foul. In your opinion, what else could have Taron done to make the tackle and avoid the helmet to helmet contact during the replay? It seemed unavoidable for Taron and definitely seemed definitely didn't seem intentional. So yeah, this was the first play of the second half against the Chargers. Uh, Taron Johnson tackled Gerald Everett and got flagged for a personal foul. Um, it's funny, when the play happened live, I thought it was going to be an Ed Oliver for kind of coming in a little bit later and trying to clean him up, although he actually didn't hit the player. He didn't hit Gerald Everett. So the call goes on Taron Johnson, and, and this is what it is. And I I hate it. I don't think this should have been a call, but by the by the rule book, I, I guess the – uh, the officials called it correctly. So uh, he le he led with the crown of his helmet into Gerald H Everett. Uh, I don't think that he made contact with Gerald Everett's head. I think he made contact with his shoulder, uh, but you could certainly see one angle looked like he was, you know, he was going to make contact with that ear hole on the helmet. Um, but honestly, it doesn't matter. The NFL rule book says that you cannot initiate contact with the crown of your helmet. And so I guess... Taron Johnson initiated contact into the shoulder of Gerald Everett with the crown of his helmet, and he got a 15-yard penalty for that. And so uh, that's the reality of it, and I think it's very inconsistently applied. And I, I'm glad that it's inconsistently applied because you could probably call it a ton. It's a 15-yard penalty. Um, I'm not sure what he could have done differently. I guess he could, what he could have done is uh, got his head up, right? So instead of having the head down, got his head up and looked a little bit more at – Gerald Everett and made that contact more with his face mask up against his shoulder as opposed to the crown of his helmet. That's what he could have done. Uh, it's tough to be a defensive player in the NFL. I don't, I don't envy these guys. They ask you to do some ridiculous things uh, in the heat of the moment, whether it's not putting your body weight on a quarterback or like 
you know, there's there's instances where the the offensive player can reduce themselves down so you're not anticipating to make contact with the crown of your helmet, but then you do. Or the pass interference calls, the defensive holding. It's tough, man, to be a defensive player in the NFL. And you know, I think that's just is one of the challenges is not initiating contact with the crown of your helmet, even when you're 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 certainly not trying to do it. So yeah, tough situation there. All right, folks, that's gonna do it for us on this episode. I'm hoping to um, end this recording and go to my email and see that I got uh, some all 22 film to dive into. And I'll do that. And then of course, p- produce that episode as quickly as possible. So in all likelihood, I would guess you're going to get another episode later on Tuesday, if not early Wednesday morning, uh, just got to get the tape, but I was glad we got this herd mentality discussion in some really good questions. And I'm glad we can get into the numbers and some of the reality here with this bill's passing offense that needs to clean up and and be better, but obviously a lot of good as well. All right, folks, that's it for now. Hope to catch up with you again real soon. Would love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. We'll catch up again with the All 22 Review.